Oh, no. I just thought of like a stupid joke. You say it? It's just like, oh, this proves Mao is wrong. This is not okay. Because communism is definitely not a hammer. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it, it appears uh, communism is a YouTuber, which we use to crush our enemies. <laughs> Can you? Like, oh, my God. Could you imagine parading Gazi up in front of Mao? Like, Gazi ain't going away, baby. No, he is. There's so he many isn't. jokes we can do with this. Yeah, uh, including actually, I, I, I get fuck. What? <laughs> I was just about to put out a bounty, but I'm not putting out a bounty anymore. No, I've been I've been Careful. warned by our lawyers that we can't put out bounty. Mm. I don't. We don't have lawyers, but I assume they would tell. If us If we this. did, believe me, they would be the first to warn you. No bounties. Exactly. No bounties on this show. Um, this is but a no a, bounty show. No, but I do challenge him to a duel. A duel? Yeah. For the for those who don't know what we're talking about, you'll who Gazi is, you'll you'll learn in the rest of the episode. But uh but yeah, I I will say here and now I'm throwing down the gauntlet. Actually, you know what? I don't I'm throwing think down that you should do this. The silk and white glove. Ooh. Rapiers. Oh, wow. Yeah. I want to use rapiers. Hold on. Let me just uh, grab my Victorian fainting couch. Well, no, baby Because I'm beside myself with this display of aggression. And and chivalry, right? I'm I'm being chivalrous? I really, no, I don't like any of this. I think you should do a dance off. All right. Well, okay. I can't do that. I can't dance. I know. This would be so funny. Hello, Brace. Hello, Liz. <laughs> How you doing? I'm switching tabs here, baby. Why Let's did you? See. What tabs are you looking at? What are you looking at? Not in your business. What are you tabbing out? I'm not tabbing out of anything. You just said I'm you were tabbing. Up. I'm putting the tab. So what I do is I put, so I can look at your smiling pretty little face. Mm. I have it on one side and then no disrespect, Young Chomsky, I do put my notes over your face in, the, in, in this. And mm. so that is what I was doing. I was doing it all Oh, do tab. you put, oh, so you put the notes on the left side of the screen mm-hmm. and my face on the right side. Yeah, well, I actually I have do a, opposite. I have a couple other monitors that I also put your face on too, oh, so I can kind of feel like I'm surrounded weird. by your love. Mm. Uh, my name is Brace. <laughs> I'm Liz. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are, we are joined by producer Young Chomsky. The podcast is called. I'm not fucking telling. I'm being bad. No, the podcast is called True and On, and uh, the gauntlet is thrown. I hate when you do that voice. <laughs> I'm being bad. I'm. <laughs> it's that and the trickster voice. What's the trickster voice? Dude, would you like, you know, or are you like, I'm just playing, you know, yeah, come on. You yeah, 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 yeah. I well, hate you it know, so much. Uh, you love the trickster. But uh, <sighs> yeah, we are, we are here. I'm trying to say uh, as many times as possible this episode. We are here. The gauntlet is thrown down. It's skittering there's across no, the ground. There's no gauntlet. I literally fucking spent like $300 on a replica gauntlet for this fucking episode, Liz. What I is showed a gauntlet? You earlier. A gauntlet is like a glove that you put on. That's what I thought. So someone but tries to swipe you with it. Does the glove have any use beyond it's throwing down? Like, is it a prop glove or is it just any glove that then you call a gauntlet once it's been thrown? The gauntlet is a large metal glove that you wear with your suit of armor because you're chivalrous because you're a knight. But what about now? Now, well, now guys like me who do a has lot of society dueling just kind of carry around a gauntlet. Beyond the need for gauntlets, Liz. What Liz is asking here is: Is chivalry dead? And I'm telling mm. you, it is not. I think there's other ways to be chivalrous beyond carrying a huge, heavy glove around. Women like it when you do that, but we we can move on from this. Actually, yeah. I get a lot of compliments on it and questions, a lot of questions about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, but Liz, that's we we aren't here today to insult. Uh, things that I dangle off of my belt with a carabiner. Um, we're here to look at a little organization that you joined last year <laughs> called Black Hammer. Yeah, we're finally doing this. You have been bugging about this org mm-hmm. since, I don't know, when did you start sending this through? May? Uh, 
No, no, no. March? I've been, I've, I have been, I have been hammered up since la- early last year. So like beginning mm. of 2020. I, I thought been... it was really when we got into when they founded the city, which obviously we'll get into. Well, I, I, I will say that my, my exploration of their works um, mm. certainly, certainly increased the, the amount of time per day that I was spending looking at Black Hammer mm. uh, went bumped up from about 30 minutes to about four hours. Mm-hmm. But I have long been aware of them. Um, they are, they are a, a fixture on several social media platforms, including, including Twitter and, and I guess Facebook is really their main, uh, main battleground. But uh, I, and they fascinate me in every single way. So how did you come across them? Well, I first heard of them in early 2020 when I had seen some of their members being like is psychopaths on the internet, but like basically all people who believe in extreme politics are psychopaths on the internet. Mm. So, you know, p- fucking <laughs> essentially indistinguishable from any other moron yeah. out there. Ourselves uh, not included. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, well, we have normal politics. Um but but Ghazi Kodo, uh, Kozo, excuse me, the uh, the leader, the commander in chief of this organization, made a, made a tweet. And I know if you're like, oh, he made a tweet, like, but believe me, this is this is the genesis of a lot of the story here, saying uh, middle finger emoji, which is I gotta say, great emoji, and Frank. So fuck and Frank. As a black child in America, all through school, I was propagandized to mourn a Becky. Which remember people were saying Becky a lot last year. I wasn't I feel told like about that was the- a couple years ago, but okay. Well, this is, I mean, yeah. Well, maybe he's a little late on it. I don't know. Uh, black girls, uh, I wasn't told about the countless black girls America genocided, indigenous girls America genocided, Palestinian girls that Israel is killing through genocide right now. How fucking played I feel knowing I was crying in a class over some Karen in Europe while sitting in a school that's resting on land that is filled with the blood and bones of nameless African indigenous girls. No, okay. Yeah, that makes sense to, to a degree. It's like, yeah, we are... Definitely everyone read Anne Frank's diary in, in middle school or whatever. Uh, and you know, you, you, yeah, similar things happen to a lot of children here in America as well. But, uh, but Ghazi, um, continued uh, to really double down and kind of try to find an ideological backup for this, which he settled on. Anne Frank was a colonizer, um, which is, uh, an incredible kind of thing to say, you know, considering Anne Frank, I don't believe ever left her home country uh, due to her father having been drafted into the German army during World War One, and uh, and the fact that the Germans had, you know, obviously mistreated Africans uh, in their colony there. But the fact is, Ghazi Kozo didn't care about Anne Frank. It was just a way to get attention, and it and it worked. And uh, they they have since, you know, as the years or excuse me, year has progressed. Uh, they've since doubled down on this. And in fact, listeners might have even heard about this from a segment on Fox News about the group where they were saying they were burning Anne Frank's diary to keep warm uh, in their mountain stronghold in Colorado. <laughs> Seems like almost um, perfectly scripted for Fox News. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, Black Hammer has done a bunch of other, you know, pretty, uh, pretty re- not reported on, but widely seen social media stunts, uh, including one where uh, Ghazi was in some kind of Joker makeup, uh, cursing his enemies, dancing yeah. in front of a bunch of um, rather scrawny looking people with clubs, and and very well choreographed dancing, mind you. Yeah, I mean the guy, the guy's got some. He's talent, a showman, he's yeah, born I'm entertainer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, since then I've just watched their descent into utter, complete madness, and I think now. It it is pretty much undeniable that they are a cult and a and actually a somewhat harmful one at that. Yeah, I think most people probably heard about them, if not from the uh, Anne Frank crazy Anne Frank tweet, um, then from like I mentioned in the beginning, their big plans to build the what they called Hammer City, mm-hmm. um, which is really where you. I mean, you said that they've kind of descent, like kind of devolved into a cult or yes. whatever. Where really, where you're seeing all of that action kind of play out. Um, but I feel like before we get into what is Hammer City and also what's happened to Hammer City and what's happening to the people at Hammer City or lack of people at Hammer City, as it were. We should talk a little bit about Ghazi, who's like a very odd figure and kind of key to this entire story. Yeah, Ghazi is, I mean, there is no Black Hammer without Ghazi. And I would say there's pretty much no Ghazi without Black Hammer either. So his real name is Augustus Romain Jr. Um, uh, he was born in New York City before moving to Atlanta with his mother. So he's from that area. 
Uh, and he is the absolute undisputed commander in chief. That is his title. He's not the chairman. He's the commander in chief of the Black Hammer organization, which is their official name. So he's about 30 years old and it's kind of hard to find out much about his early life. Plus I didn't really care. Uh, but he dropped out of school at some point. He's made references to that. Although again, the guy lies a lot. So who knows exactly moved around the country and at some point worked at a modeling agency. And uh, Liz, you and I looked at his blog a little bit too, mm. from, from the early two thousands. Yeah. What it's he, like a little what, time capsule of the two, early two thousands for sure. And like that kind of early, Oh man, I don't know like how many people or how old our listeners are, but like early 2000s blogging was really an art form in and of itself, like across the board. There was like a real confessional kind of like ad hoc version. I mean, his blog is almost like a live journal where it's yeah. like a lot of kind of like party photos, a lot of Kanye Stunna shades, like yes. it's a real time capsule Food. in terms of fashion and vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also has like a kind of like confessional adolescent vibe to it i would say yeah, it's in the 20- sense that like in the way that early blogging did yeah i mean it's it's i mean i think he was in his early 20s when he started writing it you can you can pretty clearly tell um but one thing you can really pick up from i think it's called smile tone too that was his early yeah kind of clout iteration and what he then transitioned into youtube with Yes. And so that is sort of, I think, a big, uh, well, I don't know what you would call it, a, 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 a big data point to, to observe here is the fact that Ghazi Kodzo, he's not a revolutionary. He's not the next Mao. He's not the next Fanon or whatever. He is a fucking YouTuber. And uh, that is apparent in every single thing he has done since he started YouTubing. And uh, he, 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 I think in the uh, maybe 2014, I can't remember the exact year, he starts a YouTube channel and it is incredible. Yeah, I think that the, um, the transition from blogger to YouTuber is well documented kind of like across the board that it was like there was this sort of like generational jump off of live journal when YouTube launched. Mm-hmm. And his kind of early YouTube stuff is very much in that vein. Yeah, it's a lot of him uh, being very, uh, let's say, outgoing, extroverted. Um, mm-hmm. You know, confessional type stuff. A lot of it is gone from the internet. I have seen some 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 old videos that were archived. Do you remember the like "Leave Britney Alone" video? You're lucky she even performed for you, bastard. Leave Britney alone. Yes, it has that feel. Absolutely. Where Absolutely. it's very kind of like. Um, very extra, very performative, but it's not yet kind of realized its own meme potential or something. Yeah. I mean, well, remember, this is sort of before memes. I mean, this is way before like memes yeah. were sort of in, in common parlance. And so like, I mean, the Leave Britney Alone guy obviously was a, a a meme at the time too, although I don't think anybody would refer to it as that. Um, but yeah, I would agree. It's sort of like this like pre-ironic, but still sort of ironic and like I, 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 I don't know. It, it takes itself seriously in a way that I think things mm. don't anymore. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like it only regards itself with one eye, but not both. Like it mm-hmm. hasn't yet fully reached consciousness. Totally, totally. Or self-consciousness. And, and, but, you know, it, it was it was an exciting time for a lot of these people. You know, they were going to be big stars. And, you know, some YouTubers did become very big stars. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Ghazi did not have it. Um, although he, his channel, his channel did, I think get moderately popular and, uh, yeah. And he had a little bit of a, like kind of underground following. I definitely yeah. like was pouring through a bunch of old lipstick alley, uh, pages. I don't know if you ever look in those forums. They're great for gossip. I, well, um, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's, it's fantastic for gossip and stuff, especially if you want to know about NBA players <laughs> and the girls they're dating. Really? Um, but, oh yeah. But yeah, they've got they've got some old old clips still archived in there that I think you can still track down. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can I can try to post. And there's there, you know there is actually like a lot of Gazi. Con- I mean, there is on the internet probably more Gazi content than there is content of anybody else that you can name. I mean, the man has shot videos almost daily for years. There are th- you know dozens and dozens and dozens of blog posts. Uh, I mean, w- what Black Hammer kind of is is almost like a Gazi content farm, I guess. Mm. It's it's sort of bizarre, but it's it's like it's it's almost like the next level of YouTube for him to get attention. Um, but you know, it, around 2016, 
he sort of parlays his YouTube career into joining uh, the African People's Socialist Party. And now I can't actually tell when Ghazi joined that. Um, the, the, the APSP is part of the Uhuru movement, which uh, is a lot to get into here. There are many similarities to Black Hammer, uh, in, uh, except it is, it is, I believe, a all-black-led organization with a sort of version of the Black Hammer Reparations Corps, which we'll get to later. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a strange organization. Anyways, Ghazi joins, um, and there is actually a video of him in 2016 going around a group of five white people and sort of uh, dressing them down a little bit and you know, g- getting them to say why they're giving reparations. Uh, specifically, they're giving reparations to the organization that, that Ghazi's in, which actually you might just call pay- paying them. I, I don't know. I'm not here for a debate on that. Uh, but, uh, there is a kind of interesting part where he, he sort of, uh, gets this Jewish woman to like, kind of confirm that like her Hungarian Jewish ancestors, like weren't really Jewish. Uh, it's a, it's sort of a difficult thing to watch. It's, it's, it, you know, it's basically people being pathetic on video, which is, you know, not hard to find on YouTube, but I never like watching that. Um, yeah, this, uh, this was definitely a moment where that was, uh, trending to say the least. And he was able to kind of capitalize on a lot of kind of, Mm, I would say confused and un- unclear energy uh, in the wake of like Trump and what was going on and all that kind of stuff. And he really, it was like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Going balls it. to the wall. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so the Uhuru movement is basically founded, I uh, was founded in the, the, the mid seventies by Omali Yeshitila, uh, who was, a, you know, a guy who was released from prison, founded this uh, black led movement. Uh, basically the same time the Republic of New Africa, Black Panther Party, all those other organizations were really getting busted up by the feds. Uh, the Uhuru movement has, you know, it's based in Florida, has businesses in a bunch of different states and also rumored to be funded by this woman named Penny Hess. Uh, you know, again, too much to get into here, but, uh, but, but it's important to note that like Ghazi was, seems to have been in charge or at least have a, maybe not in charge, but a role in their version of the reparations core they're, they're sort of white auxiliary that 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 uh pay pigs or whatever that 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 they used um and so eventually at the seventh congress you can actually read this report online uh in october of 2018 ghazi is promoted to secretary general of the organization and begins to run his own office this and, is the uh, uhuru organization to be clear yes yeah well yeah. specifically the african people's socialist party but which is okay. part of the uhuru movement uh, and the political report that came out prior to that convention this year actually details some things about Ghazi that I think are, are sort of germane to what we're talking about. Liz, can you uh, can you do me the, the honors of reading this out loud to me? The office of the Secretary General is being enthusiastically assumed by Comrade Ghazi. He had already added an element of professionalism to the National Office of Recruitment and Membership, also known as NORM. Mm. before its inclusion into the office of the Secretary General. We expect Comrade Ghazi to successfully build the office. His fundamental stumbling block at the moment is petty bourgeois subjectivism. And because Mm. of the scope of this office in the party, unchecked subjectivism can destroy the progress we make in every area of work. Liz, I got a question for you, baby. Do you think that uh, his stumbling block of petty bourgeois suggest- subjectivism uh, was unchecked and destroyed the progress they made in every area of work? I am not totally sure exactly what they're pointing to here. <laughs> I'm not either, but we can get kind of a clue from a self-criticism <laughs> video published mm. on the APSP Facebook page earlier that year, where Ghazi essentially admits in a really slimy tone to having included the names of some comrades in good standing alongside the names of some comrades in or ex comrades in very mm. bad standing, possibly as a way to muscle his his way into maybe the position of secretary general. Yeah, this is this is kind of a little bit of a thread through this whole story. I mean, and you know, many such organizations, you know, men, this this befalls many organizations. Yes, either. Yes. If it's like corralled or organized or even just like individual careerists within. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a common theme. Yeah, it is a common theme, but also a common theme with him. <laughs> yes. So, okay. This report comes out in October of 2018. November of 2018, the African People's Socialist Party put out a statement on their website talking about the expulsion of Ghazi 
for unidentified offenses. Um, I have heard several rumors of what he was expelled for. None of them even remotely confirmed. I had heard that he put out a hit list. I don't mean that literally like to kill the people, but like an sort of enemies list. And was it was basically tried to uh, backstab the wrong person and kick the fuck out. Mm. Also many such cases. You mm-hmm. only hear about the successful ones. You don't really hear too much about the unsuccessful ones. So it's funny, Ghazi actually talks about uh, the APSP uh, a few times in the beginning, like in the very early uh, stages of the Black Hammer website. There, are the, I mean, they put out a lot of articles. And there is one about APSP where he says, Now, I know cult is a big, scary word, and to this day, it's difficult for me to say that I was part of a cult. What I'm about to share with you is going to seem like something out of a movie, but I don't want you just to believe my words, so I brought evidence with me. Why would this young woman let this man control her like this? Because Aretha, a woman the article is about, has been put through years of mental and physical abuse, which has broken her to a point where she doesn't know right from wrong. She only knows what that whatever O'Malley wants you to do, you do. I know this because I was one of his puppets as well. So that sounds like maybe he's trying to put himself some distance between him and the cult. But what he's actually doing here is he's learning. Hmm. Uh, Ghazi also had in that article posts a video of the woman in question saying, we owe you our li- our lives to you chairman through tears, which is the exact same thing that you can see many black hammers do. If you click on the hashtag, um, the real Ghazi on Twitter, which is just constant black hammer members talking about how much he's saved their lives, how great a guy he is. So, okay, before we keep going, let's, we need to talk about actually Black Hammer. Like, what is Black Hammer? When did it start? And when you say, I mean, do people really refer to themselves as hammers? Yes, which is cool. I will say that. It's the problem with Black Hammer is Black Hammer is a cool name. I got to give it to them. Okay. Calling yourself a hammer, I think, is kind of cool. It's very corny. But it's cool in like a Sharks and the Jets kind of way. Real cool. Yeah, I guess I think the aesthetics are like very cringe. Oh, yeah. The actual like art and everything they use and like the way everything they do yeah. looks looks like it's shit. It's too much. Yeah, yeah it's, too it's played much. played out. You got to be more yeah. innovative. Yeah, very, When I very start up my call, it's going to be way mm. more innovative. Oh, I cannot wait. Uh, they, they call her the Polish Jared Leto. We're reopening the wing, baby. <laughs> So Ghazi actually started Black Hammer in February of 2018, or excuse me, 2019. Uh, so you know, a little bit after he got kicked out of uh, out of the APSP, and it's you know, if you're asking me what Black Hammer is, like what does Black Hammer believe, there actually isn't a ton of evidence um, <laughs> that one can point to that they believe in really much of anything. Um, they uh, their lines get a little confusing. So they they sort of I mean it was started by ex members. Uh, they claim of the New Black Panther Party, the Hoover Movement, and BLM, whatever that means. Uh, and uh, you know it seems like it started first as like a Black Power organization, sort of modeled directly after Hoover. In early videos, uh, every member starts their, including non Black members, starts their sentences with with Black Power. Uh, at some point, uh, that changes to land back. I have heard from several different people uh, who would be who would know about this that that's because Ghazi could not get enough black members to join, and so sort of broaden the scope of it. Mm. Uh, their actual lines on like politics and stuff are a little confusing as well because they seem so crude as to be almost like nonsensical. Um, they, 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 it's sort of a, and this might be a little too in the weeds for some of our listeners, but it's sort of like a crude, and I mean crude, mishmash of of the stuff that is in, uh, in Jay Sakai's book, uh, Settlers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mao, like very, you know, sort of half read Mao, uh, and somewhat like also maybe like African socialists. It's a little unclear, but there, there, there is like essentially no real like theoretical writings or any documents like they're pointing out what they believe they uh they support very much the the modern prc the people's republic of china which many maoists do not like very very vocally do not 
There's no, uh, there's no references to the JDPON on their website or anything like that, any other sort of Maoist international uh, organizations or lines or anything like that. Um, and they, they essentially have a mission statement, which is one paragraph that is really the only glimpse into what they believe that says that they exist to take the land back for all colonized people worldwide. They're focused on building dual contending power, which you know we love to, that ding something in our head when we hear that. Uh, of and for the colonized masses, uh, and then a bunch of just like, you know, it goes on. It, it doesn't say much of anything. So Liz, could you, uh, could you hit me with this mission statement? Yeah. So Black Hammer Organization exists to take land back for all colonized people worldwide. We are focused on building dual contending power of and for the colonized masses. Under the leadership of the colonized poor and working class, our mission is to use our collective building power to unite, strengthen, and liberate all colonized nations. Currently, our physical and intellectual labor is being coerced to build for the capitalist white colonial state, but it can be redirected to a noble cause. We will organize our labor to be service to our people. Our symbol, the hammer, represents breaking the chains of colonialism and building a self-determined future for all colonized people worldwide. So you mentioned that it's this kind of like mishmash yeah. between all of these things, but this very kind of bizarre like surface reading. I to honestly like it, it really reminds me so much. I was reading through a lot of the kind of, you know, Gazi has a ton of blog posts on the Black Hammer site yes, that are very odd, um, a bit incomprehensible, uh, certainly incoherent, mm -hmm. uh, and not like you say, not don't really form any kind of coherent ideological line. Yeah. But it really does um feel and read like someone who kind of got a mishmash. Like if you could read settlers via tweets yes. and the little red book via tweets and kind of, and like state and revolution via like tweets. Yes. This is the kind of politics that you would create, which is to say that like so many of the words sound right. He says dual, I mean, setting aside that contending, I don't know what dual contending power is. Like there's very odd little things there. Like yeah. or even the use of dual power doesn't totally make sense there. Um, but there'll be like little, there's, there's like a lot of buzzwords thrown around and there's a lot yeah. of things that sound right. But then when you kind of take a step back and are like, Hey, wait, what does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. And I don't mean even necessarily that it doesn't make sense in like, it's nonsensical, but it actually kind of, um, I would say like ends up maybe uh, kind of just stating how things are as they exist actually in the world, as opposed to any kind of utopian project, even though all the buzzwords make it sound like a utopian project. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's really the thing with, with, with black hammer too, is I mean, once we get to hammer city, it really gets laid bare, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, it's, and, and you know, the thing is too, I, like, I want to be fair about this. Like I get why people would join this organization, not, maybe now, but you know, at some point in the past two years, you know, yeah, absolutely. wanted to be in like a black led organization, uh, you know, a, an organization that seems to take very aggressive stands, like hundred percent, I get it. And they, you know, they had like self-defense classes and, uh, reading groups and all this kind of stuff. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, is like, you know, speaking, speaking as, as, you know, the preeminent, uh, Maoist in America, this isn't Maoism. Well, yeah, I mean, I do want to like, just to clarify, like when I say all of that, I'm not calling anyone like a mark or anything, or I think a lot of people seek out organizations and especially political organizations. And we know for a fact how many people did post 2016. Yes. It shouldn't come to any surprise. Uh, I, I think that, you know, um, yeah, I have, this is, I have, this is all about just like really Gazi and the organiz and the kind of um, like leadership that he had and what his own personal project rather than, you know, the people yeah. that kind of got swept up in this. I mean, that's the thing. It doesn't really have to be that coherent because the whole point of it is just to get people, uh, you know, kind of into Ghazi's sphere. But we can't talk about Black Hammer without talking about what? I just 
fucking keep thinking about Benghazi. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, um, like like Benghazi, I, I you know, Ghazi has not gone away yet. Actually, Benghazi pretty much went away. Let's be oh, real. it's not good. You know what? It's not going away. Oh, yes, because next it's month. coming on the show. That's right. Um, oh, well, nice little teaser there, baby. Mm-hmm. But uh, but but one thing that did go away, actually, one thing that never existed in the first place <laughs> was a little place. I keep saying place in the sentence. Going to say it five times more. Was a little place that I'd like to place in the lexicon, which that doesn't make any sense. What I just said. Anyways, we're talking about Hammer City, baby. Yeah, Hammer City. This got a lot of buzz on the internet, and this is I think this is when I finally started responding to your text messages about Black Hammer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um and was like okay fine I'll I'll try to finally take a look at, uh, at this I think a lot of people probably heard about this because this is also God when was Chaz? Uh, Chaz was sometime last I year. It, it was last right? year, but I I think it was in the summer of last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> higher body count than the Cuba protest, by the way. Chazes were sweeping the nation. Hammer City yes. was kind of a Chaz. Oh, or an attempt at a jazz. Yes, it, it's Hammer 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 City. Hammer City was Mountain Jazz. <laughs> um, so the deal with Hammer City is Hammer very prominently featured in all of Black Hammer's um, you know online rallies, what they would call like sort of their live streams. Uh, all most many of their articles, all of their all their social media stuff was fundraising for something called Hammer City. Now I do want to implore you if you have a couple minutes. Please go to their website and check out the Hammer City plans because it is the like renderings they did for Hammer City look like something that would be out of like a Star Wars video game from 2002. Like it, it's like sort of a mishmash of like kind of like dome homes, maybe what they imagine. Like if someone described like an Adobe village in Mexico, like they're at, but modernized, like what they're take on it would be i mean it's it's kind of crazy looking but then there's also several other plans that's just one circular building um the the tagline for it was liz hit me with it no colonizers no cops no corona yes which <laughs> this was the i this made me laugh so hard the first time i read it there was like a very strict no covid selling point it wasn't like a protocol i would say it was a selling point it was don't worry 100 when you come here there's no covid where we are which yeah they had figured out something that i guess literally no one else had which well, kudos I, to I, them i guess if you go deep into the mountains and never leave your like weird little lair i mean you can't really get covid there um you know so it sort of makes sense i mean the, so the thing is hammer city was originally supposed to be in florida we don't know why it got changed. Probably real estate prices in Florida maybe were not very conducive to Hammer City's budget. Uh, but Hammer City actually raised, and it's still going, $100,000 from this, which is very important to keep in mind, and uh, and started posting videos of them in the mountains outside of, I think, Colorado Springs, um, somewhere mm-hmm. somewhere in Colorado. Uh I don't know if you saw these videos, but like it was mm-hmm. like a bunch of very scrawny guys sort of listlessly moving boards, like two by fours from yeah. one small pile to another. Mm-hmm. And then like doing like squatting pictures in front of like some, some bushes. Yeah. I remember when this came, this like happened because, uh, I know a little something about Colorado and I was looking at that and I was like, what do they know about temperature in Colorado? <laughs> Because in the summer, it gets very hot, like very, very hot. And then in the winter, it gets not Alaska cold, but basically whatever would be one step down from Alaska cold. It gets colder than I think people think. Um, Not to mention the obvious other stuff. I mean, it was just such an odd choice. And I think what struck me about this moment is how many people were taking it very seriously online. like, And we're really kind of policing any kind of snark that maybe others had for it well i do think i will say i do think it was pretty widely met with disbelief because i i mean i remember the word jonestown being thrown a lot around Mm, a lot too because let's let's get real here i mean if your organization is supposed to be i mean these guys throw around the word masses like i throw around pennies at strip clubs i mean it is like they are they are obsessed with the word the masses are not in the mountains of colorado uh, no disrespect to the mountains of Colorado. It's just the masses are usually in like urban type areas or like usually areas where people are. Um, and so 
it was it, it was met with a lot of disbelief but you know it was like they're actually building hammer city like okay you know wow they they their cult is taking it to the next level um unfortunately they kind of went dark for a second and uh someone dug up a facebook post on may 21st by the san miguel county sheriff <laughs> that said uh liz can you can you do your best uh, mm, uh sheriff's, sheriff's voice? voice voice yeah yeah unfortunately i don't know how to sound like a cop but mm-hmm. i will try can't do it just gonna really do my voice this. no 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 okay deputies responded monday evening to a trespass report on a property south of norwood where a group of eight to twelve people from the quote black hammer organization were camping prior to a property purchase that ultimately did not occur when deputies arrived they advised the group of the trespass and they left the area without incident Deputies found some individuals were legally armed and posing no threat to public safety. There have been no there have been no reports that the group has since been seen in the area. The Black Hammer organization states on its website that it quote is a revolutionary mass organization dedicated toward building a sustainable future for all colonized people worldwide. End quote. So, what is to say? I mean, that is all to say that Black Hammer never bought the land. Uh, the land deal did not go through. And they left peacefully when the San Miguel County Sheriff sent a single deputy up there to inform of that of that fact. What land were they supposed to buy with a hundred thousand uh, dollars? It's really unclear, but it was. I mean, the pictures they posted—they're all in like a really heavily mountainous area. Um, I mean, I'm sure someone could like figure it out or you know geolocate it or whatever. Mm. We, we can we can call our sponsors at Bellingcat to do that after this. Um, I think they're already but, there. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> But uh, but it's 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 super unclear. Um, I mean, they didn't spend a single dime on this apparently because they didn't actually purchase the land, uh, and so that was that was a big, I would say, what's the what's the sort of youthful parlance for this? A big L for the organization. Mm. Uh, Hammer City was destroyed by a single sheriff's deputy, also breaking the pledge of no cops. So Black Hammer wasn't really heard from for a while after this. I mean, they kind of kept, I mean, they were still talking shit, but they kept a pretty low profile and never addressed the fact that they got evicted. Um, yeah, I they, think people just figured that it kind of like fizzled out and wasn't a thing anymore. At least that's what I assumed because I didn't keep up with it and didn't really hear anything from them. Well, they did put out some good articles about Cyberpunk 2077 uh, and various wait, wait, things wait. like this. Is that the video game? Yes. Okay, that's the one that doesn't work, right? But it d- does not work. No, I think still currently doesn't work. But it's supposed to be really cool. Liz, I I I, I want to clear something up with you right now, and I really don't want you to take this the wrong way at all. I think Young Chopsy knows what I'm about to say. Um, a long time ago, a video game called The Witcher came out, and, and based on a beloved Polish uh, fantasy series that mm-hmm. people really liked. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was a big, it was a big deal for Poland. Like I think the Polish president gave a copy of The Witcher Three, a a, a well, very well received video game, to Barack Hussein Obama as you know, as sort of like a you know, some kind of diplomatic president or something, present or something. Um, Following that, the studio based in Poland, uh, a studio, I gleaned all this from the uh, from the Black Hammer article, by the way, a studio called CD Projekt Red, which I assume means something in Polish, um, was uh, worked on a, 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 a video game adaptation of a board game called Cyberpunk 2077. Unfortunately, um, well, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a Polish joke for this. Unfortunately, unfortunately. <laughs> They had chickens working on the computer. I can't it think. I can't remember any that Polish jokes. That doesn't even work. Uh, well, neither does this video game. And uh, it was released. And it was very, people were so excited for it. People were like, I want to get into the future. I'm so excited. Yeah, it was like, oh my God, this is this is like what the future is going to be. But it's a video exactly. game so we can see it. In next generation, like, you know, and, it's going to come out. Yeah, NRX guys were so excited because it was like crazy accelerationist. Um, and, uh, unfortunately the screen door on the submarine, 
um, was opened and the water rushed in. Oh, come on, come on. Well, okay. uh, Congrats, you remembered a Polish joke. The Polish Polish Air Force made up entirely of pigeons. um, Don't say uh, that. Okay, well, the Polish Tank Corps made up entirely of uh, horsemen. Sorry, the video game didn't work. And, uh, but it and didn't so, work on like specific computers, right? It like didn't work on like most things. I think yeah, you had to because have, like, you really needed nice like computer. really nice computer. Yeah, maybe it's yeah. just and, like, elitist. It didn't work on PlayStation. I think it's ba- I think it's the only game that's been taken off the PlayStation Store. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, so after that, uh, if Poland really went into a spiral. There's a civil war there. All now. right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Anyways, Black Hammer wanted to make their readers aware of this fact. Um, <laughs> I mean, thank God. Exactly. Yeah, it's the gaming Black Hammer demographic is is a strong one, and it's good that they're looking out for that. Um, I think that uh, several media organizations could take a uh, tip or two from these guys. Anyways, uh, they have finally now admitted what went wrong. Chief Anko, or as you'll find out, former Chief Anko, a, uh, a a Mormon from Utah, messed up the paperwork, and according to Black Hammer, did not print out one piece of paper, and so the land deal fell through. Mm. Classic. Not that classic, actually. Not that classic. Real easy it's, mistake to fix. So, okay. Liz, your organization, you, by virtue of being annoying, raise $100,000. I'm saying you're like Gazi here. I'm not saying you're Liz. You could raise way more than that because you're so beautiful and charismatic. <laughs> All right, go on, whatever. Well, what? Okay, let me keep going. So you raise $100,000. You fuck up buying some land in Colorado. You kind of disappear. What do you do next? Well, obviously, I go rent a five-bedroom house in Atlanta for $3,000 a month. That's right, bitch. You buy a Jeep. You rent a house. You take pictures of yourself out clubbing. Take a lot of pictures of you, you and the organization going out to brunch. All that kind of shit. And what you must never do is tell anybody who donated exactly what's happening with the money. <laughs> Yeah, Hammer City is basically a hype house. Yes, yes, it's <laughs> Hammer City hype house. So yeah, I mean, li- literally, and I mean this literally as we're going to detail here. It actually is as an yes. idea. It's like an idea hi- hype house and a physical, literal hype house. Yes, and and keep in mind too, like Gazi is the face of this organization, and like constantly, all everything kind of revolves around him, um, and he is fucking mum on where this money is going and this causes apparently a lot of problems within the organization so that basically the 12 like top leadership of the organization really the core of the organization all move with Gazi to atlanta uh he has since announced that the plans for the hammer city money is to buy a house in atlanta mm-hmm. uh which i don't actually have no idea how much real estate is there but i don't know if 100 that maybe it is um but uh, they're all living together, which is sounds like a fucking nightmare. Well, he's not going to buy it outright. He'll have a mortgage. Yeah, but still. If he's like, even doing the, that. Are you going to go to the realtor and be like, so I, we don't have like an income necessarily, but we do have a bunch of white people who play video games because there is a reparations core Twitch channel and give us money. And also we stole $100,000 that we said we we're going to build a city. Yeah, with. it's definitely not 2007. No. Um, so black hammers all living together. They immediately, like literally like a few days after they got there, start flyering, uh, uh, neighborhoods that other groups like PSL and like neighborhood groups are working in telling people that they're the devil and that they're cops and blah, blah, blah. Uh, basically starting to start fights, uh, film themselves disrupting a, a, a pro Cuba protest. Um, and, and last week, a, uh, a group of dissenters from the black hammer, New York city chapter account, Posted actually a pretty a pretty long and unprecedented, as far as I know, thread uh, about uh, about some of Gazi's abuses. And I don't know, Liz, do you want to read a couple of these? Yeah, it's pretty awful. Um, the account starts: Gazi has been manipulating, threatening, and abusing members for who knows how long. He uses fear, political education, and gaslighting to control dozens of young adults, especially folks fresh out of high school or college. Last week, he kicked out a member of the Atlanta Hammer House at 8 a.m. for not doing their job well enough and had four defense members drag this African woman outside while Ghazi themselves poured bleach on her clothes. Mm. Ghazi also makes members who make him upset in the Hammer House sleep outside for the night. Ghazi has threatened to evict three African queer women and non-men out of their homes. Ghazi has successfully kicked out two queer, dark-skinned, non-binary Africans. 
Ghazi has called an African mother and forced her to say that she needs to publicly thank them for, quote, helping them and that this mother, quote, owed Ghazi. This is after it was exposed that he refused to let any leadership help her find housing. I mean, it fucking goes on. It's really um, just like really kind of like scary, clearly yeah. sadistic. Um, yeah. Very obviously manipulative uh, actions that they're claiming that, that he did. I mean, yeah, we're told that all of our worth is reliant on being in this organization and working around the clock all while the money is being used on bullshit and our comrades are being left homeless. We are loving, we are good people. And all we wanted to do was help the people suffering around us. And that was taken advantage of. Yeah. And I, and I do believe that like, that is probably true for the vast majority of people who you know joined this organization is that they wanted to help people. I mean, I yeah. think that happens a lot with this kind of stuff. Um, I'm sure many of the original LaRoucheites were the same way, but, uh, you know, after this black hammer doesn't respond to really any of the allegations, although they somewhat did in a video last night, although not in a, uh, any way that I would deem helpful. Uh, but they actually started to post pictures, uh, full names of the people who were, you know, had left the organization with devil horns over them, like sort mm. of, uh, you know, sticked on and digitally, and the word pedophile or pedophile apologist over all of them. Um, they also started, uh, I mean, Black Hammer has like a lot of Twitter accounts, obviously, like m members operate multiple ones. Like, you know, I'm not stupid. Obviously, you don't have that many members. Um, but, uh, you know, tagging people's work, uh, like, and saying, you know, this person is a pedophile. They need to be fired right now. They did this multiple times to multiple, like basically everybody who's quit the organization, they have said, uh, they have said that they're either a pedophile or a pedophile apologist. This is by the way, based on nothing. Um, and, uh, and, and then has tried to get them fired. Uh, they also put out a hashtag that's a hashtag, like I mentioned earlier, the real Ghazi. This happened right after after all these allegations. Uh, everyone's saying, you know, Ghazi taught me to love myself. Ghazi showed me love when no one else did. Ghazi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and actually last night, I think I was keeping you guys updated on this. The Black Hammer did the most insane live stream I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, you were like live tweeting this. I my understanding is that there was about three hundred or so viewers. I'm assuming that half of those were brought by your live tweets. I would say oh, the vast majority of that, and like I actually feel like you know a little like maybe that's bad because Gazi is really big on views yeah, and stuff like that. Feeding but, the spectacle is always a dangerous game. But it is. It was one. It was the most deranged thing I've ever seen. So it started with this a was on woman, Twitch, correct? This, no, this was on YouTube Live. Oh, YouTube Live. Uh, and what's the they, competitor by the way, to Twitch? I, exactly. Yes. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I don't can. know why I'm saying that. So actually, to preface this, I, I, I've, I've made references to them a few times before. But Black Hammer has a reparations core, which is like uh, white people who are uh, given a, a a letter instead of a name, and are uh, I read some leaked internal documents about, you know, just to give you a glimpse of this, uh, detailing how one member of the reparations corps had tried to commit suicide and was being committed to a mental hospital, but wanted to donate $2,000 to the organization before she did. And she still can pay her average dues of a hundred dollars a week. Um, that is horrific that, that someone could take that money and, and, and deal. I mean, that's just, I don't, that's, that's sickening. Um, but the black hammer live stream that I watched last night, it started the first thing that really caught my interest was a woman standing up and saying, land back, daddy-o, you got owned by the Shark King, uh, which was just really set the tone for the night. But it was, you know, it was, it was, there's about three rows of people and Ghazi and the, the, his sort of three uh, top lieutenants sitting next to him. And then further and further back, I think the lower and lower rank you were. Um, they, uh, Ghazi was clearly in charge. Everyone was enraptured by him. I mean, it was, it was, there was a really, dark energy to it, which, you know, sounds stupid to say, but it was something really just rotten about it. Um, he, he, th this was, this was a live stream that I watched because it was supposed to be, you know, them sort of tackling the, uh, the accusations that have been leveled against the organization. Um, he said some stuff about like, I think this is probably a reference to the mother that was, was mentioned by black hammer, New York, uh, a woman, this woman is letting her children be raped. They contacted her white husband, which they, you know, and uh, that he called the police and then he discussed this with them. Guys, he seemed very excited by that. Um, 
they, they he makes the woman I, I think referenced in uh, in when 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 the the four members of the security you know threw a woman out and poured bleach on her. He makes that woman stand up and essentially forgive him and say how much he loves her, uh, and uh, and how it was her fault and that she shouldn't have acted like that. I mean, it was it was. It, this was, I would say, the most Jim Jones type thing I've ever seen because this is this is you know Jim Jones would have these insane meetings uh, in the in the People's Temple and then at the White Knights in uh, in 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 Jonestown. It really reminded me of that. Um, you know, he is he he also starts talking about you know members who had left. You know, mentioning them of course by their first and last name uh, and uh, and 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 actually led his 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 you know group of about twelve people in. Uh, chanting hashtag pressing charges. And then since you love the feds and the state and white power so much, go live with them. We will sick the wolves on you. He makes many explicit references to calling the police on ex members and trying to get them arrested. He very explicitly says that he knows, uh, you know, he can get in contact with a probation officer of one ex member and that he actually has contact with them. He will be going back to prison. I mean, this is psycho shit from any kind of organization, uh, let alone one that you know espouses the 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 things that this this organization does. Um, and then eventually, he just admitted that they're using the Hammer City money for whatever the fuck they want. Um, it was bizarre, and it got even weirder because one member who Gazi had stand up and detail his disability, which was uh, he has seizures sometimes, started having or fake having, it's a little difficult to tell, a seizure. And Gazi, instead of anyone helping him, Gazi turns around. And starts like saying how in a low, quiet voice how much he loves him, and starts essentially Jim Jones style faith healing him. Um, this this lasts for several minutes, and then Gazi turns around and asks for donations. This later happens again, um, and uh, and you know the the guy has a seizure again, which and again I kind of think it's fake. Uh, after which Gazi says "fuck" and Frank, and then announces uh, he will be changing his pronouns, which uh, I am not taking very seriously. Um, and uh, it was, I mean, it was three hours long. It was a spectacle. And it was honestly like, it sounds really funny. And a part of it, you know, was funny. I mean, this, I don't this, think it this, sounds or, funny at all, actually. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it was just so chaotic and insane. I mean, at one point, he gets Chief Onco, the guy who fucked up the Colorado deal, to, to, to sit there while all of his, he calls an election and then he just says who's going to be in the seats or who says he's going to be in each position. And uh, he has this guy's, uh, you know, comrades get up and, you know, criticize him on this live stream. And, you know, it was people who raised their hand. Then he has, he calls up the guy's boyfriend who did not raise his hand and he forces him to criticize his boyfriend sitting next to him and then vote against him for the secretary general position. I mean, what the fuck is that? I mean, it's just like a whole sadistic show. I don't know. Yeah, It's yeah. like, yeah, it makes me feel really sick, to be honest. Yeah, I, I mean that that's the thing. It, it it's it's sadistic. I mean, there's a lot to get into with Black Hammer that we don't even have time to get into. I mean, it's it's very obvious that, you know, I sort of learned the tragic story of this one one member who's in leadership, uh, Chief Sa, who um, Ghazi has apparently convinced uh, she is the victim of you know child trafficking and pedophilia uh, with against her adopted parents, all this kind of stuff. It really just awful, sadistic, manipulative stuff. And like, it is. I mean, this is. This is a cult. Like it's not like a joke cult. Like this is a cult, and like the people who are in this cult and the leadership. I think you know there are some people who really have a lot of blame to take. But like if you know members of this cult, like rank and file people, really, really, really hope you can get out. Um, but there's more too. I mean, there is there is a method to this madness. Yeah, it's interesting. There was a leaked document, internal document, that was leaked. I don't know why I said it like that, but I'm just gonna keep going. Um, <laughs> Uh, called Operation Storm of White Tears. Um, and this is sort of like an internal PR playbook. Uh, it's real. It's a real interesting thing to read, especially in light of everything that you just detailed with the 
not Twitch stream. I keep wanting to call it Twitch stream. Sorry. Might as well. Live stream. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's an, like I said, it's an internal document and it kind of uh, lays out these three phases. It's called Operation Storm of White Tears. The goal, manufacture a controversy around Black Hammer to popularize our narrative by, quote, emotionalizing an old post or video, we lay down a political line we've already united around, meaning we control the flow of the narrative and we get the masses to deepen their engagement with our brand. I'm going to pause here for a second and say that there's a lot of language in there that sounds correct, but if you strip it out, doesn't totally mean something. And that's even, I'm even talking about that just from a marketing perspective, not a political perspective. Mm -hmm. But uh, phase one, ride the wave. Summary. The beginning of OSWT, that's Operation Storm of White Tears, was long before some white woman dug up our dirt. The beginning is the dirt. We must dig up our own dirt, stances we've already made, and hold the anti-colonial political line. These stance must there's agitate... A lot of, there's a lot of typos in here. Yeah. Around, quote, hot topics... And individual members must be drilled in the correct political line to present a unified response. Kanye West is a beast at this game. Black Hammer should emulate the Kanye's of the 24-hour news cycle. This phase unfolds in two alternating steps, outrage and sympathy. First, we start dropping controversial takes to spark a conversation. Then we reveal sympathetic details, our personal lives, in around our personal lives to humanize us and make us empathetic, thus getting the masses even more invested in our manufactured narratives. I want to, I'm just going to like repeat that because I feel like this is really key. I'm sorry. I guess you could just rewind, but I really just want to say this. This phase unfolds in two alternating steps, outrage and sympathy. First, we start dropping controversial takes to spark a conversation. Then we reveal sympathetic details around our personal lives to humanize us and make us empathetic, thus getting the masses even more invested in our manufactured narratives. That like basically describes the way that modern media works and and how almost all like politicians operate. Um, yeah, it's it's really striking to me, and that and I mean that as that's how modern media like social media operates to a T, mm-hmm. whether people realize that they're doing this or not. And I will get into that. I promise. Um, but it goes on. One known hot takes, and it lists some, you know, examples. The Anne Frank incident, Ghazi speaking to Kimya about the failure of feminism as a theory, date unknown. <laughs> Thanks mm-hmm. for that note. Uh, Alex argues with a sex worker over Pornhub, etc. So it's kind of like it knows these little like hot, but like hot takes, hot things they can push, aka the stuff that ended up on Fox News and got them publicity. The stuff that you know caught my attention. That's the only way Absolutely. I saw it. Known causes for sympathy, A, health issues, B, inspirational past, C, identity. Phase two, hook the masses. Summary, once a sizable audience is buzzing around our pages and engaging with our brand, whether positive or negative, again, whether positive or negative, we come out with an interview on a broad-based platform. The interview must be secured in advance to ensure Black Hammer enters into a, quote, positive media cycle. We become famous for being famous in essence. One, collaborate. Two, land an interview. So, I mean, yeah. It's really, I mean, to me, this is so striking because it's so bald. Like, it feels like taking, put like the the insides feel on the outside when you're reading it. Like, it feels gross because I think, at least for me, as I'm reading this, and including phase three, which we'll get into, like, it feels like shit that I see every day that people reproduce without even fucking knowing it. And so seeing it kind of written out like this, is like almost sickening because it's so familiar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is you can really tell like there's a there's a YouTuber content creator type background here. Yeah, because Twitter is, even. Yeah, yeah, because this is really like I mean, there there are a lot of people there who I think really think about this stuff and do it. I mean, I, and then, you know, do it do it basically in the same, you know, step 1 and step 2 right here basically as it's written. But there's also like a lot of people who I think kind of do this stuff naturally too. Yeah, like absolutely. This has become a really natural mode of engagement. Um, and and in that way, like it's it's really, I mean, my God, what a what a what a strategy document of our times. Yeah, 
Phase three, destroy our competition. Summary. Okay. There are two main categories of competitor, the communist type and the social media brand type. I guess Black Hammer is the uh, resolution there. Yes, yes, yeah, that's just dialectic. Kidding. The first we divide by attacking with an aggressive recruitment strategy, pit leadership against each other and absorb the people who leave. The second we destroy through protracted war. <laughs> I mean, okay, my Sorry, God, man. I can't man. just pause and laugh. I have my to pause God, and laugh there. Let you baby. talk a little bit. We could, it was protracted people's war against Bossip. Like, <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about, brother? This is insane. One, attack the leadership of prominent, quote, revolutionary orgs. Pit their membership against leadership. Dig up dirt. Pit leadership against each other. Force them to choose sides. Isolate the org from the masses wherever they interact. Shut down their social media pages. Cut their sponsorship. Win their audience. So that's pretty standard um, operating procedure. I mean, that is kind yeah. of getting to the heart of, like, what people think cancel culture is. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that kind yeah. of mode of attack. Whether And I mean that outside of any kind of debate. I just mean, like, the kind of mechanisms that happen there absolutely um they're kind of describing in that attack mode well it's also really reminiscent of how revolutionary organizations were destroyed in the 60s and 70s right i mean absolutely yeah sure it's 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 basically i mean this could have been taken from a cohen Telpro document yeah it, it could have been attack the reactionary social media brands we are copying this is protracted struggle we must mirror the activity of the enemy as closely as possible so that their audience and our audience become the same post what they post when they post and how they post we do not strike first wait for the brand to fire the first shots escalate conflict return criticism ramp up aggression the enemy cannot do the same because they were designed to distract from struggle to diffuse to not be on the offensive weaken the audience's faith in the brand lay out material contradictions in their layout point out the political um yeah i mean this just like describes so much like you said just so much behavior that i think we witness that just reading this ugh, it's just like it's like really giving me the creeps um yeah yeah i mean it's 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 funny too like i mean that is that is like Again, like we 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 said, Gazi is a YouTuber, and you that a lot of that sort of YouTube mentality comes out here, especially with number two there. I mean, one thing that Black Hammer is you know sort of notable for is the fact that they they I don't want to say cover, but they uh, basically like aggregate celebrity type news from you know I'm sure uh, they they give the example in this document of the Shade Room, uh, and then add a bunch of like three Ks in a row if there's a K in it or like a C. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they talk about like Ben and JLo colonizer, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's funny because it's like, it's an insane strategy, but it's also like, they're obviously like a big part of the strategy is to become a media brand. Like this isn't about talking to the masses. I mean, these people, what connection to the masses these people have? They're just like insane 22 year olds. Um, and, and like, this is, it. it's like, this is really, I think where the heart of this is like, it is, I don't know, like the, the, Operation Storm White Te Tears was revealed after they went really hard after uh, Kevin Rashid Johnson, uh, who is a uh, you know in prison uh, member in a, a sort of Black Panther spinoff group, a prolific writer, um, and you know he 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 detracted or excuse me he uh, he criticized a political line and then they attacked him like fucking crazy mm. and like you can see them put these these methods into use too i mean they they famously sort of filmed a video of them just fucking with the homeless guy dressed in all black in colorado and then manufactured a controversy which was that colorado antifa which they said the guy was in because he was wearing all black uh but it's obviously just like a homeless tweaker um had declared war on black hammer and they were retaliating so like these are i mean this 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 is being employed yeah it's crazy you know there's this book that I haven't read, I haven't read, um, but I see it's like a very popular, it's like a very popular like nonfiction book right now. It has one of those like very hip looking uh, covers, rainbow covers. And, like mm. I think it has a rainbow on it or whatever. It's very, has People very nice typeface, um, but it's called Cultish. Have you seen that book? No. It's this Amanda Montel, I think is the name of the writer. Um, and it's like kind of like a, you know, how like, um, everyone's kind of publishing these like QAnon kind of like, Oh, the, psych yeah, the yeah, psychology yeah, yeah. behind cult, like what's going on with America, all that. It's sort of of that same, uh, it's like of that breed, I think. But the difference is that I think that she's a linguist. 
mm-hmm. which is interesting. And so she's kind of approaching it. It's very like popular history or whatever. Um, again, I haven't read it, so I can't even, I can't recommend it or anything. I, I just, um, but she's like, she really approaches the language that cults use as a way of like answering, is this a cult? Is that not a cult? I think maybe she has a podcast. Again, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't actually know. <laughs> But my point being that she goes like uh, into great detail, just focusing on the kind of language people use and the language games that people play. Yeah. Um, And, you know, a lot of people have talked about the kind of like love bombing and saving and like that kind of stuff. That was always a big thing that they focused on with Jonestown Um, and the, you know, that sort of kind of like 60s, 70s type of cult whatever yeah, yeah children of god all that kind of stuff yeah totally um but also like these kind of like demands for transparency and vulnerability um as a way of kind of like breaking down people whether they do that through like struggle sessions or even just like the language that they themselves use yeah um but a big one also is like creating new vocabularies with like invented signifiers that all kind of signal in group. Yes. Labeling. Like now you're part of this group because we, oh, you know what I'm saying. And if you know what I'm saying and you're repeating what I'm saying, then I know it's like a signal to me that we're in the same group and whatever. And so this kind of like reproduces like, you know, it's like jargon or you know, mantras, obviously that's like a classic one and like label Mm -hmm. classifications, like nod, nod, wink, wink or whatever. Um, And she really like focuses on that. And you see that in the kind of, like at the beginning of this, I said that it feels like this mishmash of like a very thin layer mishmash of like reading political texts, like from the internet and kind of like, like Mm -hmm. a weird, like, um, I don't know. It's like if an like a twi- it's like a Twitter bot or something. You know what I mean? Yes, Where it's yeah, like kind yeah, of yeah. right but not right. Mm-hmm. And so everyone is sort of like playing these language games with each other, but there's nothing beneath it. Oh yeah, there's no meat to this whatsoever. No, except for the kind of like cultish attitudes and the sort of like um you know devo- like demands and devotion that he requires of the members. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say absolutely. I mean, the way they talk, they have a very specific way of talking. I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know, maybe people might get bummed at me for saying this, but like, uh, you know, there's a lot of non black people in this organization who uh, there are videos of them talking before they joined the organization and after they joined the organization, they started using what it clearly they think is like a black person accent when they talk, which is like pretty, I mean, extraordinary, but, you know, obviously not unheard of. Um, you know, and, and, and the way they tell I me, mean, they start every sentence with land back. You know, they 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 have uh, certainly from all the live streams I've watched, they 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 have like their own jargon that they sort of, you know, use with each other. And and also like people's I think one thing that really like strikes me is like this is a fucking cult is the fact that the leader, the commander in chief Ghazi, like exorciate. I don't even know how to fucking pronounce that word, but like dresses down members in public, very public, like very much prominently uh, you know in the organization's discourse will like make you look weak and like a fool mm-hmm. and then make you publicly apologize in front of people you know i have been uh in you know in when i was when i was uh with the group i was with uh, in middle east uh, we uh we had what you you know criticism and self-criticism sessions every night rachna or it was, it was called tech meal they took it from the pflp uh what they, they learned in the 80s um and you know, it was about five minutes and you'd be like, yeah, I fucked up. I shouldn't have done this. And like, or you did this, you shouldn't have done that. And there was like no rank. You can kind of do, say whatever you want to anybody. Um, and that was fine. It was private. It was not, you weren't allowed to really talk about what happened in it. Um, and this is so, I mean, this is fucking live streamed, right? Like I was watching this guy's boyfriend get called on by the leader of the organization to basically tell him that he was incompetent. And, oh, I should mention too, at the end of that, Chief Anko, uh, you know, the guy who was demoted, uh, was informed by Ghazi that he will be leaving for Colorado the uh, shortly after. So he was kicked out of the house, um, you know, and presumably out of his relationship with his boyfriend that was there. Yeah, it's it's I mean, there's a there's a heavy darkness here. But like you you mentioned to me before we started recording, like this isn't really Jonestown. Like this is almost like this is this is something else. 
you know, and I do think there is something like to be said for like treating people like adults and maybe like, you know, some kind of acknowledgement from institutions that that would have like mitigated some of that stuff. I don't know. Anyway, beside the point. But instead, all the kind of like little bureaucrats at the CDC and the government and whatever and little apparatchiks like no doubt very well trained in whatever kind of like admin roles that they have and whatever, like, you know, whoever comes up with this kind of like stuff, they said, no, what we have to do is like 5d five dimensional chess marketing stuff to like trick people into doing what they want them, Mm -hmm. what we want them to do, because like, that's what we know how to do. Like, you know, I'm not because there's some, you know, I'm not suggesting that it's like, because there's some like smoky room, or like where everyone's like deciding this, but rather that like, what's fascinating to me is that we have like an entire generation and God knows like what comes in the next generation or whatever, but like of adults who are now in these institutions who like all collectively, like their first instinct is to think like a marketer, right? Mm -hmm. Like their first instinct is to think, okay, how do I trick someone into wanting to buy Coca-Cola? How do I trick someone into wanting to put on a mask, right? And it's not even like, I don't even know if it's like um, conscious, you know, it's just like a knee jerk reaction. Like we have, you know, in this kind of, um, you know, in the invention of mass culture and everything that is produced out of that, we have created like an entire society of like first and foremost marketeers. And you see that like so clearly in this document, you know, um, it's like everyone is just one, it's like individually marketing to each other. And the only way, I mean, he doesn't even think of, I mean, you know, whoever wrote this document, I'm assuming Ghazi, like he doesn't even think of the organization as anything other than in competition in the kind of uh, like free market of ideas in the social media space, because there is no other way to think of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I absolutely do. I mean, you know, he refers to his political organization, the first paragraph as a brand. Yeah. And so like, especially like, you know, as you know, for people who have have any kind of professional, like careerist opportunities, whether that's in like, you know, the social like state bureaucracy or academia or like f- fucking YouTube or political commenting or whatever, like basically there's just this entire generation of like fucking professionals whose first inclination is to figure out how to like Don Draper every single situation, even when that is like supposedly political, you know, Mm -hmm. or supposedly about a a kind of like utopian project or whatever. And like, I don't know, like it's so it, that's what that, that's what's been so striking to me about this whole situation is that like, it just feels like all of this and everything about black hammer has like way more in common with soul cycle than it does with Jonestown. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there it's it's weird because I think Ghazi is like a bad person, and I think he is capable of some harm. But it does remind me a lot more of like, I mean, wasn't there like a Lululemon cult too, or like some weird, not like a you know cult worshiping ball? Although I mean, that's entirely possible. But like, it, it, I remember too, there was that g- gratitude cafe in the Bay that kind of got busted. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. It reminds me a lot more of that. Like it's a marketing cult rather than like, Mm. I mean, because that's when people fall into these things like Herbalife, et cetera, it's like they begin to like believe in them, right? And it's like- Yeah, and like even Amazon, like internal communications operate this way. They demand that people uh, like do pledges and complete tasks in order to get reward badges and are given like, you know what I mean? Like it's become- it's something so much bigger, I guess, than, I don't know, I can't really put my head on it and put, like, my finger on it. But um, it's definitely something in the water, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really, it's kind of been astounding to watch because, you know, we have, I mean, everybody, if you are active, uh, you know, or, or have any familiarity with, like, left-wing organizations, you will know, you know, the the there are several groups that people call cults. You know, there's the Revolutionary Communist Party, which is led by Bob Avakian. Um, you know, there's uh, there's the Spartacists uh, who are less like have like a leader, but rather act in this cult-like manner. Um, you know, and there, there's these groups that you're sort of familiar with, but they're really like throwbacks to the 70s and 80s and 60s and all that kind of stuff. 
Black Hammer, I would say, is a very young membership and a very young attitude in terms of being a cult. And and it's 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 sort of they're less like Jonestown because they're not from that milieu. They're from the milieu of Soul Cycle. Like this is fucking, you know, Soul Cycle mixed with Jay Sakai. Yeah. I it's, mean, well, it's all produced from the same society. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's a it's a it's a sign of our times. And you know, I want to be clear, like Ghazi is a pathetic figure. I think you know he is he is a a, a fucking. I mean, I I don't I I don't think I'd be remiss in saying that this man is a is a loser. But I think he's also like I I mean I I do think that the organization is probably not going to do too well in the near future considering how many people are leaving. But um, but if I was in Atlanta, I would like watch out for this guy because people will do anything for attention, you know. And I, th- I think this guy, more than anything, certainly more than he wants freedom for the colonized masses or anything like that, is that he wants attention uh, and he will go to any lengths to get it. All right. So there is a chance that Black Hammer retaliates against us after this, mm. Liz, and I will do anything to protect you. I appreciate that, Bruce. I was trying to think of a joke, but you know what? It's not I funny. will. I will. If There's they put a picture- nothing funny about a man protecting a lady. And if they put up a picture of you with devil horns on you, it's game <laughs> That would be over. so mean. That would be so mean. Think about that. That would be so mean. I could never imagine doing that. What are they going to do when they get the eye? Oh, they're done when they get that. <laughs> That's the thing is the only thing that can defeat their brand is a more powerful brand. <laughs> the only thing that can defeat a fake Maoist is a real Maoist. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh but yeah they can they can uh they can uh suck my dick fuck them i knew you were gonna say that well that's what i say when i can't think of anything else to say but it did seem appropriate that's a pro pro what's a pro pros mean apropos pro? apropos okay there you a go pro pros? A, a professional's pros? professional <laughs> i mean it means appropriate but why am i saying apropos i don't that's how you say it apropos but why Apropos of nothing. Yeah. You don't know how to say apropos. Nobody can give me a correct addition, uh, excuse me, a definition of apropos. So I'm going to say, eh, not a word erased from the lexicon. I'm Liz. My name is Brace. Or they call me Little Apropos, the Italian flute boy. Uh, and we have here on loot and production, um, which is a dual, dual loot, pot, dual wielding loots here, is uh, Young Chomsky. The I thought you were just called... trying to say Dua Lipa. <laughs> Dua Lipa. Who's? I thought Dua Lipa and Doja Cat were the same broad until like absolutely three days agree ago. with you. Totally yeah. thought the same thing. They got. They can't do that to There's us. There's too many they D's. Can't do... Dua Lipa, many... Doja, ba- Doja, the baby, the baby. Oh Listen, here's the deal with the baby. Uh, is <laughs> mm. uh, you know that's none of my business. And I'd like to thank uh, Charlie, that is Styled Ape on Twitter, for helping me out with some uh, some Black Hammer research. Thank you very much. Liz, you got to say the word. Oh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.